than airships. With World War I looming, the British Navy looked into new technologies to provide offensive air power. Seaplanes offered some means of providing the fleet with an air wing and required minimal alteration to ships. In 1914, the British have a cruiser with a few aircraft, and they also have a man, Murray Souter, who says, look, we can do a lot more. The Germans are not going to come out. They're an inferior navy. You have to have some way of destroying them in harbor. I'll do it. How? He'll take airplanes. He'll hang torpedoes from them. They'll find the German fleet. They'll go in. They'll kill it in harbor. Brilliant idea. But Suter's first target was to be the Zeppelin sheds at Cuxhaven in northern Germany. He needed to counter the Zeppelins, but the seaplanes couldn't fly high enough to destroy them in the air, so they went after them on the ground. Three ferries were converted to carry seaplanes, creating the first ever carrier task force. The problem was that most of the seaplanes quite literally couldn't get off the water that day and had to be hoisted back on board. So the attack wasn't particularly successful, but it was a very early example of the attempt to use naval aviation and inspired the development of the aircraft carrier. It's very obvious to the British that unless they can destroy Zeppelins, they'll never win. So they start putting fighters on their battleships. Fighter aircraft were lighter and more agile than the heavier seaplanes. More importantly, they could reach the operating height of the Zeppelins. If the ship steamed into the wind to give you lift from the wings, the existing lightweight biplanes could get airborne very quickly. The problem was that when you returned to the ship, it was simply impossible to land on. A little platform 100 feet long was not long enough. The early ships simply had to wait until the pilot ditched alongside and to fish the pilot out and as much of the plane as they could recover. Uh, this was wasteful and somewhat un uneconomic and not very attractive for the pilots who got rather wet. So the idea was that if you could land the plane on, you could then re-equip it and you could launch it again. The necessity for a floating airfield for reconnaissance seaplanes had been realized for some years. This is HMS Furious, one of the Royal Navy's first carriers, a converted ship. Originally a battleship, HMS Furious had her huge forward guns removed and replaced by a takeoff deck and hangar. In charge of her air wing in August 1917 was Squadron Commander E.H. Dunning. Dunning thought, this is a fast ship. If this can speed across Scarpa Flow, the main fleet base, and I can probably hover over its forward deck because my stalling speed is equivalent to the speed of the ship. So if I put handles on the aeroplane, my squadron mates can pull me down onto the deck. And that's exactly what he did, and that was the world's first ever carrier landing in a ship underway. He tried it again the following day, and not surprisingly, perhaps, killed himself. Amazingly, by today's standards, the ship didn't have a seaboat, turned out. And it took 20 minutes for the ship to stop, turn around, and pick him up again by which time he'd drowned. He probably hit his head on the uh, instrument panel as it went into the water. So he showed that his idea of landing on a ship was practical, but still too dangerous for everyday use. As a result of Dunning's demise, HMS Furious was taken in for another conversion. This time, the after turret was removed and replaced by a landing deck. But the funnel and bridge were still in the middle of the ship, and the turbulence and smoke made landing extremely difficult. The eventual answer was to clear the upper deck of all obstructions, and the first successful aircraft carrier, HMS Argus, actually was a, a quite literally a flat-topped ship. By 1918, a workable shape for the aircraft carrier had arrived. Air raids from sea were now a more practical proposition. The culmination of what was attempted at Cuxhaven comes at the end of the war with HMS Furious's raid on the Tondern sheds, uh, which are now in Denmark. And Furious actually flew off planes from her forward deck with, with their bombs on board. They found the Zeppelin sheds at Tondern and destroyed them. 
It was a perfect example of what was attempted in 1914, but was now technically feasible in 1918. World War I had been a crucible of innovation for the British Royal Naval Air Service. For a short time after the Great War, Britain's carriers were world leaders, and navies around the globe became interested in the technology. The Royal Navy mission even went to Japan to aid in the development of her fleet air arm. But the lead was not to last for long. In 1917, American Navy aviators go over to the United Kingdom and they watch what's happening in the war. They come back after the war in 1919, having seen aircraft carriers in action, having participated in air operations, and they come back and they say, we've got to turn the United States Navy into an air-minded Navy. Back in the United States, the Navy experimented with the new technology. An old coal ship named Jupiter was converted into the USS Langley, designated CV-1. U.S. pilots now had a ship on which to perfect the new art of carrier landing. The lightweight biplanes demanded extreme concentration and skill for safe landings. On board Langley, various landing systems were tested. The ideas of Glenn Curtis were resurrected. Cables called arrestor wires were run across the flight deck. A hook on the incoming aircraft would catch one of the wires and bring it to a halt. But a too taut cable pulled the tail off, and too much slack made the plane swerve to one side. To stop that, there were wires that went across the deck from left to right, and then wires that went forward and back. And you see in early uh, carrier aircraft, the ones used on Langley, for example, the, there's a hook in the back to catch the wires that go across the deck from left to right, and there are hooks under the wheels. There's, a, there's an axle from one wheel to the next, and there are hooks underneath. They're there to catch the fore and aft wires to keep the airplane from going too far to the left or too far to the right. Another innovation was the Landing Signals Officer, or LSO. There had to be some way to tell the pilot approaching the, the flight deck whether he was level as far as the flight deck was concerned. And the easiest way for someone to do that was to stand on the flight deck itself. And uh, officers would stand there and at first use their arms to show the pilot whether the pilot was level with regard to the deck or whether the pilot was, was at the wrong angle approaching the deck. And very soon, it becomes a set of paddles. In Washington, D.C., politics were about to impact carrier development. After World War I, there's a sense that the war came out of an arms race between Britain and Germany. So the United States calls a, a Naval Arms Limitation Conference at Washington in 1921. The result of that is to stop this nascent arms race. Uh, everyone is limited in number of battleships. They're limited in, in uh, carrier strength. They're not allowed to build new battleships for 10 years, and that's later extended to, to 15. The effect of that is to cut the number of battleships very drastically. But the Washington Treaty did something else as well. It actually encouraged people to build aircraft carriers because people were allowed to use their old battleship and battlecruiser hulls and convert them into aircraft carriers. And four of the largest aircraft carriers of the interwar period, Japan's Akagi and Kaga, and the United States' Lexington and Saratoga, were converted capital ship hulls. It must be said that the majority opinion in the American Navy would rather they had been completed as battlecruisers. Inadvertently, the treaty was instrumental in forging the aircraft carrier into an awesome offensive weapon. But first, the Navy had to overcome some inter-service politics. The Army wanted money to spend on land-based air power. Billy Mitchell, an Army colonel, set out to prove that bombers, not ships, were the future. Today, history was made in Chesapeake Bay. Amid the crash of exploding bombs, Obsolete battleships were sunk by airplanes for the first time. Veteran Army pilot General Billy Mitchell did what he said he would do. 
American battleships, which once sailed proudly round the world with a great white fleet, and only yesterday were defending America. 